Good evening. Bless
good. We consider again God's promise to Noah and all creation to be present with us no matter what unfolds. Let the much-loved words and songs of this season fill us body and soul, giving us hope and helping us respond to that great plea that permeates this season for peace, peace on earth, peace on earth and good will to all. Let us pray. Loving God. has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually and there shall be endless peace. For the throne of David and his kingdom, he will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this.
The second lesson is from Micah, chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from old. When she who is in labor has brought forth, then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace." town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of, Man, of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. 
Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. fourth lesson is from Luke chapter 2, 1 through 7. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Canarius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea. and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in bands of cloth, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn.
See, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there are with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. The sixth reading is from Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 38. After eight days had passed, 
It was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the time came for their purification according to the laws of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshiped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem.
The seventh reading is from Matthew 2, 1 through 12. In the time of after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard, when they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid homage and then opened their treasure chests. They offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and had been warned in a dream not to return to Herod. They left for their own country by another road.
The eighth reading is from the book of Matthew, the second chapter, starting with the 13th verse. <clears throat> now after they had left, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. And remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be consoled, because they are no more. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. We have beheld Christ's glory, glory as of the only Son of the Father. For to us a child is given, is born, to us a son is given. In him was life. And the, and the life, life was the light, light of, of all the people. people. Let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The ninth lesson from John, the first chapter, beginning at the first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. 
there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to, the, to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Grace to you in peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This evening we have read the traditional readings for Christmas Eve, established centuries ago, leading to the elements of the Christmas story from the two Gospels, Matthew and Luke, that include his nativity as a part of their testimony. But we conclude with John's Gospel, proclaiming the word become flesh who pitches his tent in our midst. Tent pitching. That's how God initially dwelt among his people Israel. The tabernacle was the center of Israel's existence as they wandered the wilderness for 40 years and for hundreds of years afterward as well, living in the land of promise given them until the time of Solomon when the movable, movable tent became the solid, more permanent structure of the temple in Jerusalem. God dwelt among them, first in the mobility of the tent, the tabernacle, then in the static, solid temple, and then once again, Jesus pitched his tent among us, mobile once again, so that all might see his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Anne and I watch a lot of Christmas movies during the holiday season, beginning with the traditional white Christmas on Thanksgiving Day, including at least three versions of the Christmas Carol, the Muppets version being my favorite, the Santa Claus, the Polar Express, and It's a Wonderful Life. We were watching the 1994 version of The Miracle on 34th Street when Anne had a remarkable insight. You remember the film, a thinly veiled Macy's Thanksgiving Day par Parade, Product placement must have been too expensive that year, under the name of Kohl's Department Store, is about to take place. We're introduced to the leading character, one Chris Kringle, who after substituting in the parade for a drunken imposter, will take on the role as Kohl's lead Santa at their main store on 34th Street. He insists, however, on wearing his own costume. And we get to watch as Chris prepares for his debut in the winter wonderland Coles has produced as their main attraction. The preparation finds Chris shining his boots, straightening his coat with the gold thread, polishing those gold buttons, each with the picture and the name of one of the reindeer emblazoned on it, straightening his belt and donning his cap just so. That's where Anne turned to me and said, somebody ought to make a film of Jesus getting ready to come down to earth that first Christmas. My imagination went to work. Here was the second person of the Holy Trinity, the very word by which all things in heaven and earth were created. One who would be named Jesus and identified as both Messiah and Emmanuel, God with us. Moving into his dressing room, removing his crown, laying aside his heavenly robes, placing in reserve his divine powers and rights, and setting on the shelf his Shekinah glory, all in order to be wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a stable's feeding trough. Philippians 2 says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, 
but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. In their Gospels, Matthew and Luke supply a considerable amount of detail about the conception and coming of the Christ child. Though we learned some years ago that we glom them together in such a way that we miss each one's telling of the story in their own way, separate readings are revealing. Then Mark passes over the details entirely, commencing the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ with the ministry of John the Baptist and the immediate appearance of the adult Jesus ready for mission. John begins his gospel with a prologue designed to catch the reader's complete attention with the same words that began the Old Testament, the Pentateuch's declaration, in the beginning. Here's something important, the header shouts. In spite of the absence of many of the familiar ep elements of the Christmas story, John's prologue makes a significant contribution to the celebration of Christmas. The reading is always included in every Christmas Eve and Christmas Day order of service in liturgical church settings. That contribution is emphasized by noted theologian and author J.I. Packer when he says, nowhere in the New Testament is the nature and meaning of Jesus' divine sonship so clearly explained as here. John's prologue provides us with insights which enhance our understanding of the birth narratives of Matthew and Luke. These two Gospels highlight the humanity of our Lord without denying his divinity. John highlights the divinity of Jesus without minimizing his humanity. If we're to celebrate Christmas in its fullest meaning, we must not neglect either truth. Genesis begins, in the beginning, God. John begins, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. In the beginning, in John's account, cannot be merely coincidental. It must be intentional. As Moses wrote in Genesis, in the beginning, God, John does virtually the same thing in the first two verses of his gospel. And what John tells us is mind-boggling. Make no mistake about it, this Jesus is God. Before he took on flesh, the Word existed eternally as God and in fellowship with God the Father. And it's important that we grasp that fact. John's, wor John's words cannot be reduced to mean anything else to mean anything less. Our Lord is God. He is eternal. He existed in the very beginning and he has ever existed with the Father. That's what John expects us to understand him to be saying from the get-go, from the beginning, as it were. And it is what he hopes to convince all who read his gospel is absolutely true. The most obvious and important connection John makes is this. The God who created the universe is found lying in a Bethlehem manger. John wants us to know that the Jesus he introduces is the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. More than this, the Jesus who is the Messiah is Jesus who is God. Our Lord did not begin to be in Bethlehem. He didn't even have his origins in Genesis 1 and 2 when God created the world through the Word. He was there. He already existed when the world was created. He was there with God. He was there as God. The wonder of Christmas is not that a baby was born to humble parents via a virgin birth. It's not confined to the fact that this child was the fulfillment of hundreds of prophecies and the object of God's care and protection from Herod, for example. The wonder is that this infant was the second person of the Holy Trinity, come to dwell among humankind as a man, come to bear the sins of the world. 
John doesn't tell us the old, old story of the birth of our Lord. Instead, he chooses to tell us that this one born of the virgin was, as the prophet Micah said, one whose goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. What John tells us sheds a whole new light on what we read in the birth accounts of Matthew and Luke. He chooses to tell us that this birth was a singularly unique event in history, never to be repeated, always to be the source of great wonder and joy. Have you noticed those times in the Gospels when someone, especially Mary, wondered or pondered or treasured things in their heart? Mary witnessed things that were beyond her. John tells us things in this prologue which are beyond us, which should cause us to ponder this text for a good long time. Think of it. The babe in the manger is none other than the Son of God, divine himself. The one to whom the Magi were led by a star was the one who made the star. An unknown poet once wrote, the maker of the universe as man for man was made a curse. The claims of law which he had made unto the uttermost he paid. His holy fingers made the bow which grew the thorns that crowned his brow. The nails that pierced his hands were mined in secret places he designed. He made the forest whence there sprung the tree on which his body hung. He died upon a cross of wood, yet made the hill on which it stood. The sky that darkened o'er his head by him above the earth was spread. The sun that hid from him its face by his decree was poised in space. The spear which spilled his precious blood was tempered in the fires of God. The grave in which his form was laid was hewn in rocks his hands had made. The throne on which he now appears was his from everlasting years. But now a new glory crowns his brow, and every knee to him shall bow. J.I. Packer wrote in his classic book, Knowing God, it is no wonder that thoughtful people find the gospel of Jesus Christ hard to believe, for the realities with which it deals pass humans' understanding. But it is sad that so many make faith harder than it need be by finding difficulties in the wrong places. Take the atonement, for instance, or take the resurrection, or again, take the virgin birth, which has been widely denied among Protestants in the 20th century. But in fact, the real difficulty, the supreme mystery with which the gospel confronts us does not lie here at all. It lies not in the Good Friday message of atonement, nor in the Easter message of resurrection, but in the Christmas message of incarnation. It is here, in the things that happened at the first Christmas, that the profoundest and most unfathomable depths of the Christian revelation lie. The Word was made flesh. God became man. The Divine Son became a Jew. The Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby, unable to do more than lie and stare and wriggle and make noises, needing to be fed and changed and taught to talk like any other child. And there was no illusion or deception in this. The babyhood of the Son of God was a reality. And the more you think about it, the more staggering it gets. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as is this truth of the Incarnation. And that brings us back to the heavenly cloakroom, removing his crown, laying aside his heavenly robes, placing in reserve his divine powers and rights, setting on the shelf his Shekinah glory, all in order to be wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a stable's feeding trough. Being in the very nature God, 
he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, that is, clung to, hung on to, but emptied himself, taking the very form of a servant, being made in human likeness. Who makes the farthest journey in this Christmas pageant? Mary and Joseph from Nazareth to Bethlehem? Shepherds from field to stable? Wise men from the east to the promised land? Angels from heavenly realms to earth? No. It's Jesus. From divinity to humanity. Glory to infancy. Omnipotence to fragile flesh. Manger to cross. Grave to glory. All for you and me. We invite you now to light your Christmas candles. Let us pray. O oh God of love and light, on this night of introspection on the nature of divine presence.
Depart in peace and take with you the certain knowledge that God is always coming into the world. joy and love may you be filled with the wonder of mary the obedience of joseph the joy of the angels the eagerness of the shepherds the determination of the magi and the peace of the christ child almighty god father son and holy spirit bless you now and forever amen, amen. blessed christmas to all